Thank you, Beetle. Good afternoon. My name is Yorgos Marnakis, and this is my paranymph, uh, Dr. Victor Chavez, who uh, just received his promotion uh, this uh, later earlier this uh, afternoon. Let me sit down. So um, I'll just briefly introduce myself, and then I'll uh, run into this PowerPoint. Um, I'm um, I'm a patent attorney, and uh, um, I'm also a um, technology entrepreneur and also a part-time uh, business professor. Um, uh, I, I'll teach an MBA class uh, one or two um, if I can get them uh, during the semester. Um, so uh, I really look forward to this um, um, this uh, promotion here to uh, uh, get me going on my career. Uh, so I'm not going to try to uh, summarize my uh, thesis in 10 minutes. I'm just going to introduce you to some of the questions that I addressed uh, and uh, wrestled with. Uh, so let's see here. So um, the, the, the general context is that technology commercialization is undergoing uh, theory change. So we have the rise of techno science. So uh, maybe the the um, the change of the primacy from um, technology creating science to science creating technology. And uh, this has uh, resulted in um, a, a lot of new ideas about the roles of uh, relative roles of science and technology with each other and with society. Uh, we have frankenfoods with genetically modified organisms. You know, we have cyborgs, these robots. Uh, uh, um, We've uh, genetically engineered mice to grow um, uh, human body parts for uh, replacing for as prosthetics. Um, and uh, with this theory change, you've really seen a, a change in how we conceive of, of technology commercialization. Uh, uh, previously, we thought of uh, technology commercialization as a very broke uh, ornate process requiring a, a whole set of uh, special technological competencies, managerial capabilities, and now we conceive of it in almost a, a, a simple Rococo transition to uh, something that a lean startup could do with a minimal set of competencies. And along with uh, the change in technology commercialization, there's also theory change in technology commercialization models. And there's this new emphasis on discontinuity, uh, disruption. Um, and it's sort of uh, th this uh, heightened sensibility about uh, discontinuity and disruption uh, reflects our modern and postmodern sensibilities uh, uh, that we see in um, art and society. Uh, uh, it's almost like uh, you know we look for discontinuity uh, and create it if it's not there. So how do we think about theory change? And it's really a philosophical question. This is um, a portrait of Hypatia, the mathematician of Alexandria. Um, I, th I thought I would use a, a, a woman philosopher, mathematician, to keep with our, our you know our, our new uh, understandings in the 21st century of um, of society. So it's a philosophical question fundamentally. And uh, in particular, it's called the philosophy of science, which is a, uh, a, a, it's a relatively old field. And it's, um, it's, it runs parallel to actual science. And it, uh, it's a field in which we question the assumptions of science. And management, of course, is a science. So we question models, theories, worldviews, experiments. So here's, here's a classic example of questioning um, science. It's the Copernicus view of uh, the universe, uh, where he suggested that the universe doesn't revolve around the Earth, but the universe revolves around the sun, which is still not quite right, but it was um, a change. So the philosophy of science is, really marks the end of conventional wisdom. That's a good way to think about it. And in fact, with technology commercialization models, we're not looking at just one model that needs reevaluation, but the whole suite of models uh, are perhaps overdue for uh, reevaluation. And so we start asking, what is a model in the first place? And here's the model, uh, modified Bohr model of the atom. And uh, what do models represent? Do they represent reality? Do they represent our perception of reality? 
and this is a Minkowski uh, space-time diagram. Uh, do they represent artificial realities? This is a Lorentz um, um, strange attractor. And what makes for a good representation? Is this a good representation? Is this a good model of what? Uh, or is this a good model? Uh, what And what do we use to um, decide what makes a good model? Is it an aesthetic judgment? Is it a representational judgment? Is this a, an adequate uh, representation of the process of innovation? It's an old linear model. Or is this perhaps new model, um, like a plate of spaghetti? Is this how we should think of innovation? This is uh, systems thinking. And so I still haven't answered the question, what is model? And maybe there is no single answer. Uh, so suppose we think of them as these um, um, mental representations that allow for surrogative reasoning that can lead to empirically testable results. Well, if that's the case, then Oncomouse, which is a mouse that has a, a, a genetic um, modification that makes it highly susceptible to cancer, so it's very useful in laboratories, and it's considered a, la a model, a model of, uh, um, for uh, uh, genetic experiments. So then it's not a model if, if that's what our definition is, but, or is it a model? Is this a model, the Tokyo Metro? Um, or is this a model, which is also the Tokyo Metro? Which is the model? And what is a technology commercialization model? This is a nanoparticle. Is a nanoparticle a model? Um, and here's how we use nanoparticles. We inject them into mice um, and look how the nanoparticles migrate to the tumor, which makes them very useful for, uh, as wrappers for uh, nanoparticle pharmaceuticals. Is this a technology commercialization model? If it's not, what is it? And then how do we challenge the assumptions of these, mo uh, these technology commercialization models? Here we have a whole suite of models, old and new. Um, and so some of the ways we may challenge these is, uh, is it possible maybe to model technology diffusion using fewer assumptions? We want to start think, attacking our assumptions because a theory change at the base of that is uh, our assumption changes. Um, and are we maybe missing some variables? Here's the technology acceptance model. In fact, we are missing a very important variable here. It's um, uh, uh, conformity bias. And uh, what if models are tools rather than mirrors? Or what if they're both tools and mirrors? And what if models aren't representations at all? What if they're uh, interventions. And this is a, uh, an example of a, um, an, observ um, an observing tool that is actually an interventional tool. It's a scanning, tunneling um, microscope, and the way it works is it gropes the surface. It, the uh, atomic tip gropes the atomic atoms that it's um, measuring. So it's intervening while it's uh, observing. And then we have the precautionary principle. Um, um, lack of scientific certainty is not an excuse for not taking action. Um, so we're validating uh, fear of uncertainty as a policy tool. Well, is this validation actually encouraging mass hysteria about new technology? Is it uh, hindering scientific progress or is it saving us from ourselves? This is Chernobyl. And there's so many examples of this, you know, uh, these disasters. So in summary, as we're waiting for um, the professors to come in, um, we can say, why should we question the assumptions of models? Because we need to know their limitations. We need to know our limitations. And perhaps because our technology, including our models, is progressing faster than our ability to handle it. Maybe we're no different than this uh, cat looking in the mirror and wondering, what is it seeing? Okay, and uh, models are not uh, magic mirrors on the wall that will magically reflect our blind spots. They're not self-regulating. They're not self-improving. They, they're like computers. They do exactly what we tell them. And uh, sometimes we may not be telling them the right things. And that's it. Thank you very much. So we, thank you.
I hereby open the public session of the Doctorate Board and Defense Committee of the University of uh, Twente. And may I invite, and I should do this with a hammer, and may I invite the defendant to come and the candidate and the parent to take their places, please. I'll use this opportunity to welcome everybody. Um, not too much family, I say, but they're welcome anyway from a distance in mind. But particularly also our uh, colleagues, Professor Burke, whom I'm now welcoming for the second time this afternoon, but still very much welcome from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And I also understood the University of Miami. And I would like to welcome, especially who's new to the floor, Professor Moors from uh, University Universiteit Utrecht or University of Utrecht. What do you say these days? It's Utrecht University. Okay, and that's because Dutch University is a bit shifting with names at the moment. Uh, so that's very much welcome. I'm, I'm glad that you're with us. Um, and I would like to ask the candidate whether he's ready for the defense. Yes, I am, uh, Mr. Rector. In that case, I would like to give the floor to Professor Burke for to open the deliberations. Uh, candidate, um, I've read this with great interest and found it uh, very provocative in many sections. And I, I have uh, more questions than we'll be able to cover today, and I hope we have a chance to talk about it. But my first question is uh, the title of your thesis. Please uh, tell me how each of the sections connect to this title. Thank you for your uh, interesting question, uh, highly learned opponent. Um, uh, so as briefly as I can, um, the for, so the, the underlying theme, perhaps, is uh, I'm challenging assumptions, so re-examining assumptions of various models. So um, one of the themes was to, uh, uh, to look at whether or not we could uh, uh, perform our modeling with fewer assumptions. And uh, so the, the presence of uh, numerous idiosyncratic assumptions for uh, uh, product diffusion, technology diffusion models uh, pre prevents uh, comparison, uh, quantitative and qualitative comparison of these um, modeling results. So um, with the uh, Richards model, which is uh, developed in chapter one, uh, you're able to um, perform uh, modeling without assumptions and then uh, uh, engage in quantitative, qualitative comparisons across uh, phenomena and across scales, because a lot of these uh, uh, parameters of other models such as BAS, Gompertz, Logistic are also all these parameters. Many of these parameters are also dependent on the scale of the, um, the data being measured. So um, if you have a, um, say, uh, uh, you're measuring a, a large scale process and a smaller scale process with these um, more traditional models, it's difficult to com quantitatively compare the parameters, or some of the parameters. So um, um, uh, another um, uh, theme, uh, apart from doing away with assumptions, is reevaluating assumptions. Um, and so, uh, for example, in uh, chapter three with the uh, replicator dynamics, um, um, I'm able to uh, look at assumptions in um, um, small scale uh, base of pyramid uh, studies uh, that assume that product diffusion is occurring by uh, individual learning, by cognitive behavior, when in fact with the replicator equation I'm able to show that uh, the single equation can explain um, the full pattern, full, full range of patterns of uh, technology diffusion that have been observed. Um, um, so it can explain individual learning as well as um, imitative behavior. And um, in uh, um, 
Um, so in chapter uh, two, I was uh, addressing the question of whether models are uh, technology. And um, the, uh, the idea there is that if models are technology, they're interventional. And uh, when a model is interventional, it, it's perhaps limiting our ability to uh, correctly model the phenomenon. So um, for example, with its, the technology acceptance model, which is very commonly used, uh, we assume that uh, it assumes that technology diffusion, product diffusion occurs through individual learning. And we don't even try to measure uh, conformist bias when in fact all large scale sigmoidal um, Technology diffusion is occurring through uh, conformist bias, uh, through imitation. So we assume uh, individual learning is happening. That's our assumption, when in fact, um, in a lot of these cases, it, it's apparently not true. Um, I've addressed chapters one, two, three. Um, chapter four, the precautionary principle, is a um, really a mental model for um, commercializing technology. And, um, and so, uh, we really need to understand what it is uh, we're assuming. And um, uh, again, uh, tying back to the idea of models being interventional, the precautionary principle uh, appears to be validating um, the fear of public uncertainty as a policy tool, which, uh, um, which may in fact be encouraging mass hysteria uh, about technology, or at least validating it. Uh, and, um, and so there's a you know an intervention um, that we need to be aware of, and then uh, chapter five uh, was the um, index of um, clinical trials data, and that's a, really a research and development tool. It's a um, it's a tool for uh, summarizing large scale large amounts of technology commercialization uh, attempts uh, results and um, um, so that the, the construction of an index wouldn't even be possible if we weren't willing to uh, challenge the assumption that uh, indexes are statistically invalid or that they're even statistics. So I'm suggesting that they're actually measurement tools and not statistics, um, and therefore they shouldn't be um, treated as statistics. Does um, a highly learned opponent have a follow-up question or an additional yeah. question? Yeah, I wanted to ask you a, a different question about the uh, finding that the philosophy of science is a form of discontinuous innovation. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, th thank you for that question, a highly learned opponent. Um, uh, that's a, a realization I came to late in the thesis, and um, uh, really the it kind of reflects this uh, modernist uh, uh, sensibility about the discontinuity uh, that we've seen really since the late 1800s um, in uh, discrete mathematics and then going through um, uh, quantum models. And um, um, the idea is that uh, the philosophy of science is providing us a venue for um, for breaking with the past, for questioning our assumptions, for being discontinuous and disrupting, uh, hopefully constructively disrupting uh, our current theory. Uh, and um, I, I really, uh, what also came to late is the conclusion that this uh, disruptive uh, pattern of thinking uh, uh, was really first uh, articulated by Kuhn in 1962 and uh, the, Christensen and his uh, um, theory of uh, uh, disruptive technology uh, really owes a debt to Kuhn, and he, I don't think it's an acknowledged debt. Uh, I think that would actually be a very interesting research question. Uh, so you're equating uh, innovation uh, to some extent with the philosophy of science. Oh. That is a very interesting question. Um, I would say philosophy of science is a tool for uh, evaluating innovation or a tool for evaluating our innovative process. Um, I don't think I would be prepared to call it innovation itself. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.
Can I invite uh, Professor Morse to continue the discussion, please? Thank you very much, Rector. Dear candidate, congratulations. I've read the thesis with great interest, and I was looking forward for the book, but now I have it, so thanks. Um, it's, uh, to my opinion, an in-depth study where um, technology commercia commercialization models can benefit from philosophy of science type of approach. And I'm not so familiar with that philosophy of science type approach, but I, I know a bit more about innovation studies and uh, adoption models, so I'm going to ask some questions about that. Um, to my opinion, models could be very valuable on their own, and um, but you question what actually is a model and how reliable is the knowledge they produce, if I understand well. And you also question whether a model uh, is more science-oriented or whether it's technology, yeah? so whether it's more observational or interventional. And when you focus then on technology commercialization models, and how these can benefit from such a philosophy of science approach, you, uh, you develop that further in chapter two to five. And you just explained to my colleague how that thread between those uh, chapters is. Because I had exactly the same question, what is now the common thread between all these different elements? But I would like to go back to chapter five for a minute and ask you a more specific question about that. Um, I have a biochemist background and now I do for more than 10 years innovations in life sciences. And uh, I know a bit more about those clinical studies. And you um, uh, see clinical studies, if I understand your chapter well, as being um, one step in the commercialization process. And in the pure sense, that is of course the case. But in the, um, the more uh, life sciences sense, it's still um, very uh, dependent on the attrition rate, whether these innovations will actually coming into being. So did you also uh, account for these more um, technology intrinsic um, uh, changes or innovations when you are uh, setting up these indexes and try to understand what the, the added value of these are? That's a bit my question about mm -hmm. chapter five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. First question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, highly learned opponent, for that uh, very interesting question. Um, um, I don't know if you've, uh, you've ever seen this database. It took me months uh, to bring all these tables together. It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, quite massive and quite distributed. Um, and it was a um, very difficult decision to decide how to clean the data um, and how to decide exactly what uh, what was a valid data and what should be used. Um, and uh, what I decided with this first, uh, um, say, experimental approach uh, was to just put everything together and have a look at what the indexes were like, and then just to get the, the look at the trends for the entire um, inter intervention type. So uh, just to see what all of the sum data look like for uh, you know, genetic interventions, mm -hmm. um, uh, what, what they look like for drug interventions. Now that I have the, uh, say, the software written and I have some mastery over the database, it would be very interesting to go in and, and do, um, um, say, uh, different uh, analyses, as you're suggesting, uh, by sub-intervention type or by laboratory, yeah. uh, um, and then perhaps even comparing laboratories. Um, uh, there's a lot to do with this. So I, I did not uh, do as you suggested. I didn't get down to that finer level, but I'm capable of it. And, and do you think your database is um, capable also to do a dynamic analysis? Because that could also be interesting for that specific industry to get a better understanding uh, whether these indexes, indices you set up uh, can tell something about uh, attrition moment in time and uh, whether some product types are more successful than others, because mm -hmm. that's technology adoption in the end, I would say. Mm -hmm. Did you have some thoughts about that or some new ideas? Mm -hmm. uh, thank <clears throat> you. Thank you, highly learned opponent. Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, it's, a it's a very rich uh, database and it's a very rich uh, measurement model. Um, um, so uh, for example, uh, um, it was a major decision to decide to construct the uh, indexes based on the time that the experiment started, not at the time the experiment ended, which is how most um, 
say summaries are reported. And uh, as you saw, I, I, um, then I had a, a sort of temporal plot of by year of start date. Um, but, you know, a, a dynamic uh, approach. Uh, um, so, f um, I, you know, I can't uh, think of the name of the statistical technique, but uh, um, state space modeling. You know, I, I looked into state space modeling, mm -hmm. and I think that may be a really good uh, way to uh, um, um, perhaps uh, construct dynamics from this database and maybe even uh, do some forecasting. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, no, um, I, I, I would certainly be interested in a, a dynamical analysis. Yeah. It could also be very interesting for certain uh, pharmaceutical groups who are working on these studies also more on a re in a retrospective way. I know them in Utrecht, so that, oh. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then one final question about that chapter five. Mm -hmm. Are you suggesting, are you advocating by this exemplar of those clinical studies and that indices a different techno technology commercialization model or a new one? Or would you suggest to um, adapt the already developed uh, technology commercial commercialization model? Is, is that something uh, you would like to bring forward uh, now afterwards when you have all these different chapters where you focus on those? commercialization models? Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Hyla Learned Opponent, for that interesting question. Um, um, so this actually wasn't my first um, uh, my first idea for this thesis. Actually, I did a, 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 an, ex, uh, an empirical study of a, a company for several years. And um, the uh, one day I got a phone call, and the owner of the company had had a massive stroke. And so I, you know, all my data, just uh, all those years of study, just went away. So when I reconceived of, of doing the study, I thought, let me do something broader. So one failure doesn't uh, end all of my research. Um, and uh, so I haven't gone as as deeply as I'd like in some of these areas, um, and haven't fully worked out some of the impl implications. Um, um, but what you're suggesting is actually very interesting because uh, I thought of this as being a policy making tool uh, or mm. a tool for um, uh, evaluating policy because if, um, you know, if the policy is working, then the number of serious adverse events should not be increasing. Um, um, but uh, it could be that uh, we could get some kind of insight from this uh, to see what policy is working, what isn't, what experimental techniques are working, what aren't. Um, and again, if we drill down to the laboratory level with this, uh, or start comparing laboratories using different techniques, then uh, we may be able to um, uh, make some recommendations for um, uh, technology commercialization practices. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to that article. Can I ask something about chapter three? Three, yes. Um, I like that chapter because at the bottom of the pyramid is not that often um, published about, especially the technologies uh, which are interesting there. And what you do in chapter three is um, putting the following question central. Eh? How have entrepreneurs catalyzed new product adoption by bottom of the pyramid consumers? And then those new uh, technologies uh, were in the field of stoves, automobiles, and banking, mobile banking. Uh, when I read that chapter, I had some questions. And the first is, you have an adopted model of Rogers that's uh, also depicted in um, figure, <laughs> I have to look it up, I'm sorry. I think it's figure one or two in that chapter. Yeah, it's figure one, the cultural transmi transmission extension. Um, and there you add an additional uh, indicator, conformity by individuals. Mm. But later on, in the same chapter, you, s you focus on the selling to groups, eh, as in road shows or tent shows, etc., to catalyze technology adoption. And I don't understand that. How does conformity by individuals relate to um, that focus on groups? Mm -hmm. Why did you make that decision in your uh, study? Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, highly learned opponent, uh, for your interesting question. Um, um, so the um, the thesis uh, you have, the article, chapter three you have in your book is different from um, chapter two in the draft uh, uh, thesis because we got a, um, a, 
a revision back from uh, um, TASM, Journal TASM. So um, I spent uh, uh, two months actually full time reworking that. Um, but but I would like to address your question, uh, mm -hmm. and that is when you sell in groups, you give people the opportunity to see each other and imitate each other, and yeah. that is where they are allowed. They can conform to each other. So you know you're in a um, so you're in a, a, a refugee camp, an internally displaced person camp in the Sudan, where they have several uh, different tribes, and uh, um, they see members of their own tribe, maybe elders, uh, behaving in a certain manner, adopting a certain fuel stove, and then they'll likely uh, imitate uh, that social leader. Um, so if they have the opportunity to see each other or see see their elders, see what they're doing, then they'll imitate. Okay, then I'm going to read that chapter in the in the book with great interest because I understood conformity by individuals not related to those groups. So you make that link more explicit in the in the chapter. Mm -hmm. So my final questions, if I may, yep. also related to this chapter. Um, in the end, uh, in the discussion of the chapter three, the the draft one. Uh, you mentioned that further research should focus on the distinction between catalyzing initiation and cat acceleration of technology adoption. Uh, why? What, mm. what do you expect then? Because if I read your cases and think about bottom of the pyramid innovations, there is often a kind of acceleration taking place. So why are you pointing that towards further research? Mm -hmm. I didn't get that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for your question. I'm a learned opponent. Uh, uh, for, for me, it's it's still um, an area I'm not really clear about, and that is the, the the point of technology adoption and technology diffusion. So it's like a fuse that's burning, and so where the fuse is burning, it's the technology adoption, and then the the longer pattern is diffusion, and it, it's you can't have one without the other. Um, but for me, um, it's still not clear exactly. Um, what what the theoretical relation is between the two? Obviously, you can't have one without the other. But uh, you know what drives one and what drives the other, and is it the same thing? Um, I I just don't know the answer to that yet. That's why I think uh, it's worthy of further uh, research, especially in these cases. Uh, thank you, uh, Rector. I give the word back to. Uh... Thank you very much, and then I'm glad to pass it on to Professor Hensler. Thank you, dear Mr. Rector. Dear candidate, I must say I've uh, read your manuscript with great pleasure. And um, it has definitely become an exciting journey through different scientific endeavors, uh, such as philosophy of science, conceptual argumentation, and empirical research. Mm. Particularly, the self-reflexive approach of using adoption models to analyze the adoption of adoption models appears interesting. <laughs> and then uh, if the time permits, I will come back to that maybe in the second question. But before doing that, I would like to come to a first one, namely to a theme that uh, dominates a thesis, namely the duality of uh, science and technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, you really s contrast them and say, well, it's either the one or the other. And that's, of course, particularly interesting for our university, who positions it as being exactly at the <laughs> interface, high tech human touch, where the high tech has the technology approach and the human touch is a rather analytical approach of rather science, behavioral science mainly. So I would like to know how, whether it is possible, and I would like to invite you to, to think about that, to bridge this gap between these uh, two views. Could you provide this? Mm -hmm. Thank you, highly learned opponent, for uh, your interesting question. and. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person who's thought about this. Um, people, um, far greater philosophers than I, have uh, uh, written about this uh, to some extent. Um, um, so one of the, say, one of the most uh, candid uh, um, statements I read was that uh, um, technology without science is tinkering. It's bricolage, which uh, um, I know. Prof I believe Professor Berg says thinks it's a kind of a pejorative statement, and perhaps it is, um, um, but it certainly is direct, and it uh, uh, it it um, it really captures uh, this whole uh, techno scientific idea that um, 
If you say uh, that, th that things have reversed and now it's no longer um, technology preceding science, but science preceding technology, then um, you, have, you run the risk of, of eviscerating um, technology, taking science out of it, and what you're left with is, is tinkering. And uh, so um, um, the, one of these authors suggests, uh, when, uh, when did uh, science and technology switch places? Uh, always and never is his answer, uh, because science has always depended on, on technique. Uh, the Greek, ancient Greek technique. Science has always depended on technique for um, developing, and, and technology, of course, uh, especially high technology, is impossible without science. So um, I think maybe um, um, a truce between the two would be a, a, a more productive way of moving forward uh, instead of um, arguing one or the other is primary. Um, um, so uh, I, I, I believe that's all I have to say about it. Uh, um, does the highly learned opponent have a follow-up question? Or? No, I don't have a follow-up question, but thank you for these uh, views on, on trying to, to bridge them and show respect for both sides of uh, well, the coins of science. Mm -hmm. And um, as a pre-announcer, I'd like to ask a, a second question, namely with regard to the self-reflexivity. So in fact, you use a model in order to find out that models are a tool. So you, in fact, find out that tools are not do not follow the purpose that you use them for, because you wanted to try to, to get new insights. Isn't there a contradiction, or can you resolve that? Mm, thank you for your question, highly learned opponent. And in fact, um, irony uh, is one of the, and the self-reflexivity and self-contradiction is one of the, um, say, um, hallmarks of uh, science since, um, let's see, I'm trying to think, um, it was the geometer um, who uh, was publishing, uh, was it Frege, I think it was Frege who was publishing his um, attempt to axiomatize geometry and he got a letter from Bertrand Russell saying, you know, uh, when, when his uh, his second uh, volume was just in press. He got a letter from Bertrand Russell saying, I really enjoyed your first volume, but you have this fundamental contradiction as Bert Russell's paradox. And Frege had the integrity to publish it in the appendix of his um, second volume. So um, certainly every logical con uh, system contains its own contradiction. And um, this brings us back to uh, philosophy, and we have to uh, maybe rely on, of all people, Nietzsche, uh, with his idea of the eternal return, where, uh, or Richard Rorty, a, a more modern philosopher, uh, where we just have to accept with irony the fact that uh, there is no foundation, and we just have to keep uh, every moment, we have to reaffirm um, uh, the fact that there is no foundation, but we, uh, we maybe have enough in, um, reason Another ra enough rationality to accept uh, our system. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, then we go on to uh, Dr. Schuur. Thank you. Uh, Dikhan, I was impressed by your vast knowledge. Uh, you know a lot about things like Grundlagen der Geometry, even David Hilbert, so you touch all yeah. kinds of things. Um, my question will be a little more more down to earth so apologize for that um, if you know if you look at diffusion modeling it's been there for decades of course and if you see it started out as forecasting methods and then gradually uh, people like Bass started of course and the old ones and gradually more and more they realized we should make it from forecasting models to management tools and so if you look at Bass you know three parameter model See the mark potential, <coughs> this innovation, this imitation coefficient. And then he said, okay, wait a minute, we, we can look at the hazard function, P plus Q times FT, that's nice. We can try to extend that. Many people try to do that. Market potential could be extended, it could be more or less influenced by the marketing mix variables. So they did that all over the place and made Hosky Simon, for instance, they put in marketing efforts as a logarithm of the AT, you know, all these things. 
what I really, what I'm asking you is, if you look at this this uh, richest form, it looks a bit queer, a bit odd, mm. this strange N there. Uh, contrary to Bass, where P and Q have firm meanings, and you can really, you know, try to interpret them and try to put all kinds of marketing variables. I mean, hundreds of papers have done that into it. But if I look at riches, I don't see that immediately, but maybe I oversee something. So how can you make riches from a forecasting tool, which you prove to be really well done, from a forecasting tool into a marketing, helpful decision marketing tool? How could you do that with riches? Mm -hmm. Thank you, highly learned opponent, for that interesting question. Um, and uh, so uh, let me address that directly, but first let me address the context, uh, mm -hmm. because you gave a very interesting context. Uh, and I was wondering, why did, uh, mo why did the, the diffusion model research uh, develop the way it did? Why did we go from having um, these sigmoidal models to being unhappy with that to then eventually um, turning to agent-based models. Mm -hmm. um, why? And uh, I think it's because of computing power. The availability of more computing power and the improvement of the graphical user interface mm -hmm. allowed scientists to start doing this more sophisticated computing. Um, so, um, but then to address your question, uh, in the uh, revised chapter three, I do have a little bit of a discussion. It might be in the earlier draft of trying to connect the M and the K parameters of Richard's sure. model to. Yeah. Um, I saw uh, that, yeah. Even, yeah. you know, the, the K, if it increases, get more and more sharp and all that. Mm -hmm. But then again, if I would like, let's say, I would like to introduce marketing or as, uh, let's say advertising uh, expenditure, mm -hmm. where would I put it? How could I do that in Richard's model? Mm -hmm. You know, I think a systematic approach, uh, uh, highly learned opponent, uh, a systematic approach to this question would be good. So first what I would do is um, take your data with different advertising, different marketing, and run the Richards model in it and get your various parameters and see how um, those, uh, uh, those um, different uh, marketing, advertising uh, uh, interventions affect the, the, the pattern. Mm -hmm. And then once you have enough uh, data, you could maybe um, come up with a regression solution and eventually an, an, an analytical solution. Um, um, but, you know, I, I think that's really interesting. Um, um, you know, I might consider uh, looking at the M parameter and um, re-parameterizing it. Uh, I, I would probably use... Um, um, there's a, a, a Greek uh, physicist who's done some really interesting work on, um, on using e exponential scaling uh, and showing how exponential scaling is really at the basis of the development mm -hmm. of thermodynamics. So I would actually think about reparameterizing the M parameter using this exponential scaling and maybe see if I can come up with an analytical, um, um, say, uh, you know, you could introduce M equals the function of P and Q mm -hmm. from the BAS model and uh, to some exponential power that uh, may reflect uh, the synergy between the, the two parameters. Um, um, it's a very interesting question, I think. Uh, okay, I think that can be done. On the other hand, you also could use a kind of marriage of best model and riches. If you look at, uh, let's say, the propagation of successive uh, generations of technology, yeah. you know, there have been uh, things like, for instance, in 19... 80, what was it, 87, mm -hmm. Norton and Bess had that model. Mm -hmm. And that Norton and Bess model is only involving mm -hmm. capital F, you know, and the capital F is, of course, the cumulative uh, adoption. If you replace that F, mm -hmm. that's a question to you, of course, but mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> suppose you could replace that F by yours, by mm -hmm. my, your, your Richard's formula, mm -hmm. and yeah, let's say you, you are modeling three types of successful generations, mm -hmm. Would that be fitable? Do you think that would be done? So you start, I don't know if, if you know about Norton and Bess, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the capital F there, I, I don't use the best F, but I, know I, I use Richard's F, put that in there. Mm -hmm. Would that work? Would I fit that in a way, or what, what's your idea? Yeah. Um, I have a learned opponent. I think it's a mathematically elegant approach. Uh, what I would do actually is, is start out by taking 
the um, Richards equation, as mm -hmm. you say, and set it equal to the Bass equation, and then see if you can um, start anal analytically isolating um, and, and substituting. Uh, but I would actually probably work with a difference equation version of both of them. I think difference equation might be easier uh, than the, uh, the differential equation. Mm -hmm. See if I can start uh, rearranging things and make an analytical uh, solution to it, to M. Yeah, sure. And then plug that back yeah. in. Okay. By the way, there is also some, I also try to find some criticism about riches. Please. And uh, I found uh, <laughs> there was a big toolbox uh, called growth number two. Maybe you know it. Oh. And they, they look at riches and say, wow, it's nice, but we also have the Janoschek curve, Janoschek model. Wow. And that growth curve has a flexibility of the Richard curve. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> but it is easier to fit and it's easier to manipulate. It rarely fails to converge during nonlinear regression. That's what they tell. So I was yeah. wondering if you also looked at Janoschek as an alternative for riches. Um, highly learned opponent. I've never heard of the model. Um, <laughs> But it depends I on here, but <laughs> yeah, no, it depends on which version of Richards you're using because there's a three parameter version, but I'm using a four parameter version, which is much easier to work with. So yeah, you don't use four parameters, so it, yeah, it's, it? it's, it's, okay. it's, it's a bit simpler if you see okay. it. Okay. But I didn't test it myself; I just saw it in a toolbox, and I wondered, hey, maybe that's something. If I may get the site from you, I'd love to look at it. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Uh, could I have a final a question? Final one, briefly, yes. Okay. If you look at, uh, generally, um, if you look at, uh, suppose you have a set of data, given set of data, uh, what do you think about the following approach? Suppose you, you have, you select beforehand, let's say, a number of growth models, let's say 10 or 12 or whatever, okay? And what you do then is you fit each of these models to the set of data. And you know, but the, the, the familiar thing of having half of the data predicting the other half, right? Doing that, you have all kinds of, you know, accuracies. Mm -hmm. And suppose from that set, you choose the best one. So then you, you fit that data, you, you predict that data, you focus the data using the selected model. Mm -hmm. uh, then I would say you're always doing better than whoever using, is using a fixed model. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong or... Or, or would it be an approach? What do you think about that? Uh, highly learned opponent, uh, the the bass, the logistic, the Gompertz all have uh, assumptions. You know yeah, that the, sure. as you know the, the so if if the asymptotes line up as they're supposed to, um, if uh, you have an idea of the underlying mechanism and it matches um, you know your final result, mm -hmm. uh, your final choice of model, then I think it's justified. But if you come up with the best fit and it's still uh, not uh, theoretically a match, uh, I think true. you would have a very <laughs> difficult time getting past referees with that. Yeah. Getting past referees would be very difficult. <laughs> I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for pushing it to the limit, I think. Uh, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Professor Helweg, what was yours? Thank you, Mr. Rector, uh, dear candidate. Um, from someone from outside the uh, the world of technology commercialization um, models, uh, reading your thesis was a highly uh, interesting learning experience. Um, on a side note, I still I have to say that I'm still not sure if abductive reasoning isn't actually what many lawyers in academia do all the time. <laughs> uh, but perhaps we can discuss later. I, 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 Given your background, I, I can imagine that you have a take on this. Mm. Uh, but for now, I will focus on Chapter 4, the precautionary principle, mm. particularly because I have, you have a, a fairly, uh, you voice at least, a, a fairly strong opinion about the precautionary principle, which is good. Uh, but I'm still not sure if I can fully agree with what you say, in, uh, especially when you say it amounts to that uh, if the public thinks something is an unknown risk, then protective action should be taken. And that is that it is a model that validates and operationalizes the fear of uncertainty. Um, uh, as a first thing, I, I still struggle somewhat uh, with your, uh, well, particularly the, the legal analysis side of this, um, of this somewhat bleak, maybe, or pejorative interpretation of uh, the precautionary principle. I can understand that in terms of the empirical analyses, when you refer to Slovich and Todd and Lujan, uh, but I sense something of a disconnect when it comes to the more legal take of this. Uh, I, I don't really see the legal argumentation here. 
uh, to the effect that, uh, as you say, uh, the precautionary principle tells judges and lawmakers that the layperson's perception that something comprises an unknown risk is an acceptable reason for taking protective action. Um, as far as I see it, on the contrary, I know, I, I know many cases where the, especially the courts uh, do find that the mere dread is insufficient cause for applying the precautionary principle and that there has to be a likeliness of a false negative um, uh, beyond a mere hypothesis. Um, so that's actually very much alike your uh, preliminary uh, injunction analysis. So I would like to hear what is the underpinning in, in the analysis for taking this position, or should I understand it only as a sort of empirical state of affairs? Thank you, highly learned opponent, for your uh, interesting comments and uh, uh, question. And um, uh, thank you especially for struggling through a t uh, technology uh, thesis. Um, um, so um, let me answer your question, but first with a little background. Um, um, so I'm almost sorry that this um, chapter was published, uh, um, not because I want to retract anything, but because, um, um, well, it, I have a lot more to say. I have a lot more thinking to do about precautionary principle. Um, and it's not like it's new to me, you know, uh, like a lot of us, I was first introduced to it in 1992 at the Rio conference uh, on environment and development. And I've been thinking about it since then and I, you know, haven't been able to understand it. Um, uh, and I've read, uh, you know, there's been an explosion of articles about it and um, some of them are, are very interesting. Some uh, certainly, um, most of them make some theoretical progress. Um, but I don't feel like I really read any breakthroughs uh, in understanding it. Um, so when I saw this psychometrics analysis, I thought, okay, uh, now there, now I have something to say about it. Um, and uh, um, actually, I personally support the precautionary principle, even though my analysis uh, is telling me otherwise, um, um, which is you know a different matter to talk about. Um, so. Um, I, I wonder if uh, the legal analysis is, uh, say, tortured or tenuous because perhaps it's not really a legal principle. Um, you know, even though it's been adopted as one, it's almost like a, a sociological uh, tool or a sociological model. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to uh, disagree with its value. Uh, you know, perhaps the precautionary principle would have saved us from Chernobyl or Love Canal or DDT or or the PCBs, poly, uh, uh, brominated uh, biphenyls uh, also. Um, um, uh, uh, in retrospect, uh, if we look back at uh, the past and we think about what um, our, our experience would have been if had we had the precautionary principle 40 years ago, 50 years ago, things would be very different. Um, um, you know, we wouldn't have uh, caused all of these birth defects in, uh, we meaning the United States, wouldn't have caused all these birth defects in Vietnam, for example, with Agent Orange defoliation, uh, or I hope so, anyway. But if I may, please, uh, how can it be then that if I hear this and I compare it to the statements that effectively, I think, boil down to you not wanting to, to uh, frame the precautionary principle as a legal principle, but rather as an approach, rather as something that should be still in the realm of sound science, risk and traditional risk analysis. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the same time, you're naming these examples that, that clearly fit with the, the Collingridge uh, dilemma that we sometimes have to act in a stage where mm -hmm. still there's not the definitive information, but at least at that stage we can interfe mm -hmm. intervene. Mm -hmm. I mean, that certainly along the legal line perhaps is a plea to actually accept these sort of interventions mm -hmm. and, and consider them as necessary constraints to mm -hmm. technological advancement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is why I, one reason I wish I had, had uh, arrived at this understanding uh, earlier and had more time to... Uh, develop my ideas, um, but, but I do get to it in the end where I suggest that we use the precautionary principle to identify risk and then use traditional risk management. You're allowed to finish a sentence. 
Then we use traditional risk management um, to look at solutions and implement solutions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Madam Beadle. Um, may I ask the power and M to get to take the seat, return to the seats for a moment, and then um, I adjourn this public meeting and invite the audience to stay here until the public or the, or the committee will uh, return uh, after deliberation.
ladies and gentlemen, I uh, reopen this public meeting of the Doctorate Board of the University of uh, Twente. And I would like to ask the candidate and his paranymph to stand in front of the committee, please. The Committee of Deans of the University of Twente, represented by us, has examined your dissertation and heard your defense. The Committee of Deans has decided, in accordance with Article 718 of the Law on Higher Education and Scientific Research, to admit you to the degree of doctor. I request the first, second supervisor, the co-supervisor, I guess I have to say, mm -hmm. to perform the task with which he has been charged. I would like everybody to rise, please. Under the authority assigned to us by law, <clears throat> and on behalf of the Dr. Dort, I grant you, Jorgos Dionysus Marinaker, the degree of doctor and all the rights that are attached to this degree. As evidence of this, I present to you this diploma signed by the Rector Magnificus, the Secretary of the Graduation Committee, and all members of the committee, validated with the seal of the University of Twente. For the photo. Okay. Als ik meer zit dan, please. Ja, mag gaan staan. Nee, als de. Yes, you go the. Wait. Well, I'm giving you your legacy, and uh, I think you would entertain us all. To, you know, it was fun, as I've heard many people say, uh, as a publication record for uh, a somebody going to get their PhD. I believe we have 10 now in publication and then so quite high and they're all published and uh, it's just a, been a pleasure to work with you. A wonderment to work with you and I think you have a lot of questions you might be able to find people other people to work with. You probably want to get rid of me. Smart move. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Rainer, uh, it's been a joy to work with you and he together are enjoy to work with you, with uh, Yorgos, and I think you have a, just a brilliant future ahead of you in academia, and I'd love to be part of it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Let me stand up and be the first one to congratulate. I can hardly say the young doctor, because I understand there is a, uh, but anyway, it is the young doctor, one way or another, that's how we refer to it, even if it's the third or the fourth or <laughs> however old you are, so that is the Dutch culture to the right. Yeah. And uh, I have here a small present, as uh, you are already aware of, seen it, which is the book, the dissertation uh, signed. Um, we met this morning, uh, we had a very pleasant talk and I immediately saw your interest in art. You have not even noticed that, all of you, but I should share a little bit about um, um, Yes, subscribe underscore um, what uh, your promoters have just said that the commission was very impressed by what you're doing. Provocative, uh, eclectic mastery. Um, some people talked even about work in progress, but they did not so much talk about the dissertation as well as the whole um, universe you seem to be constructing uh, in combining different things. And in that sense, there were some uh, desires, I think, uh, do a little bit more the construction and the connection between the different uh, components that you have now so very eloquently uh, elaborated. I mean, that if, if you want to go on and everybody feels that you are not to be stopped in this way, that would be a next uh, step. I don't know whether that should be a next uh, PhD or a doctor defense. <laughs> that could be the answer. <laughs> But I mean, I, I think it really was, I think we all enjoyed it, um, uh, seeing um, you perform here today. And it was my pleasure 
uh, to meet you uh, this morning. So with that being said, I would like to uh, congratulate this uh, achievement and hand you over this uh, dissertation. And would I request you to take the seat, please? <clears throat> and um, I think this means that we are at the end of this uh, special three days. And may I particularly thank the people that have been spending a lot of time behind this table with me. I think uh, there's a special reason for a congratulation on this, although that is quite uncommon. But uh, if you celebrate uh, 15 years with this kind of uh, performance, also and show that it's, it's not only delivering entrepreneurs and writing articles, but also uh, doing what actually I think we should do, be doing at university is to educate on the um, PhD level, um, uh, <coughs> new researchers and talented people. I think you have succeeded and that is something I would like to uh, extend my congratulations and my thanks actually. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That being said, um, you know the routine by now. If you're in, well, we'll take the two candidates. Uh, we'll take the two candidates, and after uh, the um, cortege has is up there, you're allowed to follow us to the next step. And now this time, I promise that drinks are ready uh, at the end of the corridor. And with this, I close this meeting. Ja, 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 ja,